वेलकम गाइज इन दिस टॉपिक वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट समथिंग कॉल्ड एज एक्यूट फेज रिएक्टेंट्स सी एक्यूट फेज रिएक्टेंट्स आर द मॉलिक्यूल्स विच आर गोइंग टू इंक्रीज और मे बी डिक्रीज ड्यूरिंग द पीरियड ऑफ द एक्यूट इन्फ्लामेशन और मे बी ड्यूरिंग द न्यू प्लास्टिक एटियोलॉजी मीन्स वेन एवर इन द बॉडी वी हैव द इन्फ्लामेशन और एनी न्यू प्लास्टिक चेंजेस दैट इज अकरिंग दैन दीज रिएक्टेंट्स द एक्यूट फेज रिएक्टेंट्स देयर क्वान्टिटी विल बी इंक्रीज और देर विल बी सम फेज रिएक्टेंट दैट क्वान्टिटी विल बी डिक्रीज सो इफ देर आर सम मॉलिक्यूल्स दैट इज अ ग्रुप ऑफ मॉलिक्यूल्स दैट इज गोइंग टू इंक्रीज ड्यूरिंग द फेज ऑफ इन्फ्लामेशन दैट इज द कोल्ड एज दे आर कोल्ड एज द पॉजिटिव एक्यूट फेज रिएक्टेंट्स दे आर कोल्ड एज पॉजिटिव एक्यूट फेज रिएक्टेंट्स पॉजिटिव मीन्स दे आर गोइंग टू बी इंक्रीज ड्यूरिंग during inflammation or any neoplastic change if there is any neoplastic change or inflammation they are going to increase that is called as the positive acute phase reactant and there are certain group of molecules that are going to decrease during that period and they are called as the negative acute phase reactants so we should know that which are the acute uh, positive ones and the negative ones so the example of the the positive acute phase reactant means the molecule that are going to increase during the acute phase of inflammation they are c reactive protein they are the c reactive protein ceruloplasmin fibrillin these are the few examples of the positive acute phase reactant whereas in the same way we have the negative acute phase reactant also the examples are albumin trans thyretine so these are the two main negative acute phase reactant is so what we have understood till now regarding the phase the acute phase reactant is either they will be increasing there will be some molecules that will be increasing during inflammation and there will be some molecules that will be decreased during the inflammation part so this is the concept behind the acute phase reactants the the second concept that i want to add here is that is related to the glycoprotein let's understand this what is glycoprotein is when we have discussed the the classification protein i told you that the protein can be the conjugated or can be unconjugated glycoprotein belongs to the conjugated protein means there will be protein part as well as the non protein part so if i write the composition of the glycoprotein i can say it is the the protein part is going to be there along with that the non protein part is also there protein as well as the non protein part the non protein part that we are talking about is a carbohydrate that is oligosaccharide that is a oligosaccharide so we are going to add the oligosaccharide on the protein molecules that is going to make the glycoprotein when it comes to the types of glycoprotein types of glycoprotein the glycoprotein is basically divided into three types the n type of glycoprotein the o type of glycoprotein and the gpi type of glycoprotein there are three i can say the sub types of glycoprotein we have n type o type and the gpi type of glycoprotein now what is n type of glycoprotein means what you are doing is you are going to add the carbohydrate where you are adding the carbohydrate depending on the protein where you are adding the carbohydrate we have divided that uh, sub categories of glycoprotein means if we are adding the uh, the oligosaccharide on the amino group that will be called as the n type of glycoprotein means n means here is the amino group so i can say oligosaccharide is added on the amino group is added on amino group if we add the oligosaccharide on the amino group that is called as n type of glycoprotein if we add on the hydroxyl group oligosaccharide is added on hydroxyl group hydroxyl means oh if we add on the hydroxyl group of the amino acid that is called as the o type of glycoprotein 
because the hydroxyl group is not present in all the amino acid it is there in the serine it is there in the th threonine it is there in the tyrosine so you can only make you can only make the o type of the glycoprotein with these three amino acid and particularly with the first two that is serine and threonine so if you add the oligosaccharide on the hydroxyl group hydroxyl group is found in only two amino acids serine threonine so if you add on them that is going to make the o type of glycoprotein uh, o type of glycoprotein the third one is the GPI type of glycoprotein. Now, what is GPI type of glycoprotein? The, the full name of GPI is glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol glycoprotein. GPI glycoprotein. Glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol. Now, they basically, these molecules are containing, these molecules are containing phosphatidyl inositol. So we are adding the carbohydrate, we are adding the oligosaccharide along with what we are adding with the phosphatidyl inositol. We are adding the glycosyl uh, means the carbohydrate part along with the phosphatidyl inositol on the protein. That is called as GPI type of glycoprotein. You are just not adding the oligosaccharide only, you are also adding along with that you are adding the phosphatidyl inositol group. Now why it is so important to understand this GPI type of glycoprotein? The GPI type of uh, glycoprotein is very important to understand because there is a pathology which is based on this GPI type of glycoprotein and that is called as paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea. Paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea. Now what is that? See, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea, what we have understood by the name nocturnal hemoglobin urea is. Nocturnal hemoglobin urea means there will be hemolysis or the RBCs will be coming in the urine during the period of night. Now, why it is happening? See, what happens is during uh, the sleep, during sleep, what happens is there is slightly increase in the carbon dioxide that happens in our body. With every one of us, Whenever we fall asleep in the night, in the mid of the night, there will be slightly increase in the carbohydrate, uh, carbon dioxide that is going to occur in our body. The reason for that is the respiratory rate or the respiratory drive decreases when we are in deep sleep. So, because of that, the carbon dioxide will build up in our body. And because we know that the carbon dioxide is having an acidic nature, so it will lead to acidosis. It will lead to acidosis. The pH of the blood will shift slightly towards the acidic side. And this is, this is happening with every day with us. In the midnight, maybe 3 m, 4 m, there will the pH of the blood is slightly acidic. That is the acidosis part that is there. Now, because of this acidosis, the RBC may undergo rupture. The RBC may rupture or the RBC will undergo hemolysis. Right? And this RBC, if it ruptures, the next day morning when this person will wake up, he will have the hemoglobin urea. Means the red color urine is going to be there. So, the hemoglobin urea in the morning. Hemoglobin urea is occurring in the morning. Now, as I am saying that all of us are having this acidosis around 3 to 4 a.m. midnight, right? But every one of us not having the hemoglobin urea in the morning. The reason is our RBC have a protective mechanism that, that protects the RBC uh, during the phase of this acidosis, right? But if someone is having, if someone is having something called as PIGA gene mutation, if there is mutation of the PIGA gene, now what is going to happen? If this PIGA gene is mutated, then what happens is that in the RBC, we have something called as the GPI anchored proteins. Normally, we have the GPI anchored, anchored proteins. What these GPI anchored proteins will do is they are protecting us from the, they are protecting us from the hemolysis during the acidosis phase. Now, if the pig A gene is mutated, these GPI anchored proteins are non-functioning. Are non-functioning. If the GPI anchored proteins are non-functioning, then the hemolysis is going to occur. And the, 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 the GPI anchored proteins that we are particularly of concern right now is the CD59 and the DK accelerating factor. DK accelerating factor, DAF. So normally in, uh, in a normal healthy individual, this DK accelerating factor and the CD59, they are working via this GPA anchored protein normally and that is preventing the acid uh, hemolysis during acidosis. But if someone is having mutation of the pig A gene, 
then the GPI anchored protein will not be made properly. Then the CD59 and the DKX3 factor will not work. And if they will not work, CD59, DKX3 factor will not work. Then the RBC cannot tolerate the acidosis. RBC cannot tolerate acidosis. A slight acidosis in the midnight will lead to hemolysis and the person will have the hemoglobin urea. So this entire pathology is referred as the paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea. The reason is the hemolysis is occurring in the night but that will be evident in the next day morning so it is called as paroxysmal this is the reverse so paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea what is the basic pathology what is the basic pathology this they what they ask in the exam is the basic pathology is the pig gene mutation now because of that what is happening the gpa anchored proteins will not work and that are the dkx3 factor and the cd59 so because these are not working so the rbc cannot handle the acidosis and they will rupture in the midnight the next day morning the patient will have the the patient will have the hemoglobin urea and this is referred as the uh, this is referred as the paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea. We have a test that can be done of, uh, this for this particular pathology that is called as HEMS test. HEMS test is done to make the diagnosis. If the diagnosis is made, then the, when it comes to the treatment part, we use something called as Equilizumab. Equilizumab is a monoclonal antibody that is for the CD35. So, equilizumab that is used for the treatment of paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Right? Just thank you guys.